I want to say, uh oh, that we um, have conversations with people every day of the week, and we talk to people and we engage with people. But when you're talking about real estate in a way that you are trying to figure out if there's anything in their life that you can help them with, I want you to focus on these types of questions. They're called forward questions. F-O-R-D. F stands for family. O stands for occupation. R stands for... Um, I have to draw a blank at least one point in the class or it's not a good class. Um, recreation. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Recreation and D stands for dreams slash death, but we'll just not talk about the death part. The, the way that you build your conversations around these four things, F-O-R-D, is if their family is growing, they probably need a bigger house. If their kids are moving away to college, they probably need a smaller house. If they're getting a divorce, they might need to sell one house and buy two houses. Occupation, if you get a good job, you're probably gonna wanna buy a bigger house. If you lose your job, you're gonna wanna buy a smaller house. So just having these conversations about what's going on in their life may give you tips as to whether or not you can help. So for instance, if, Someone came to me and they said, oh my gosh, Christy, I just heard that you've got a senior next year and another senior after that year. You're not going to have any kids left in the house. What are you going to do with 3,000 square feet? Gosh, I don't know. It's a lot to clean. I'm already thinking about it. In my mind, what am I going to do when the boys are gone? The girls are already gone. Am I going to keep this big house or am I going to go buy a condo and not have to worry about upkeep? Like it's already in my, in my brain. So if, if I'm having a conversation with you and I'm talking about your kids moving away, I'm not throwing down your throat that I'm a realtor or that I can help you move. But I can say things like, I have a lot of clients right now that are actually empty nesters. It's so interesting that you're in that situation too. And then they may say, clients, what do you do with empty nesters? Oh, you didn't know I'm a realtor. Oh, okay. Okay. There's so many different ways that you can strike up these conversations to where you can just drop those little nuggets of fact in because the reality of our world today is, is that everybody knows at least five realtors. They are everywhere. We are not a diamond in the rough. Like we, there's millions of us. But the thing that you have to remember is just because they know that you're a realtor or know you are a realtor or know of you being a realtor doesn't mean that when they go to buy that they will call you. You have to be the one that's in front of mind. You have to be the one that they think of. You have to be the one that engages with them at the right exact moment. So just remember that networking is huge, especially for new agents. Jennifer, do you have any tips for new agents trying to grow their business. I'm so glad you got on here. Gosh, by the way. <laughs> um, I think what you're saying is right. As far as if you are sending business to people, they should be sending business to you. Now, like for example, the lady that cleans my house, even she pays for herself because she'll send me business. Now don't think just because like, for example, her just because I know a realtor, I'm sorry, doesn't mean that they're not going to send you business. Um, she, at one point in time, loved the pastor of her church, who was also a realtor. Well, he ended up cheating on his wife and she got angry about it because he was the pastor of her church and now she doesn't like him and she sends me business, right? So just because they say, oh, I've got a realtor friend, don't write them off. Still constantly. It took me a couple of years to get her sending me business, but now she does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no for now, not no forever. So that's a good, that's a good thing to live off of. It may, may be no today, it may be no tomorrow, but it may not be no in a week or two weeks. Um, it's all about being there at the right time. Okay, so for the second half of the conversation today, we're going to talk about these blasted offers. 
how in the world are we going to get our offers accepted? So I want you to tell me some of the craziest things you've written into an offer, some of the craziest things you've lost an offer, any of those, I want you to, to talk about them. I'll go first. Um, so last week was like a really crazy week for me. Um, my client, we actually put in five offers and um, we finally got lucky on one, but so it came down to like what I called Tara and she's like, okay, so we had already tried escalation clauses. We had tried paying for deed and title. Um, <clears throat> I mean, just like all kinds of stuff that normally, you know, you wouldn't have your buyers pay for. And so I was gonna write, the contract we got that was accepted, um, I was getting ready to write it and I was like, okay, Tara, I have to win this one. What can I do that I've not done? And she's like, well, think of something creative. So my buyers actually own a construction company and we ended up writing in there that they would offer or that they would give a $2,500 credit to their business for um, any future repairs on the home that they were purchasing um, in the future. So painting, deck repairs, roof repairs, whatever, they got a $2,500 credit. And then we own a lawn care business. So my husband um, threw in four free lawn mowings for the year. And those were, I mean, that was, something that like not everybody could offer so I guess it worked I love the creativity I love it and that right there is what's going to win you offers right now that exactly it right there um fan good job fantastic about 10 or 15 years ago when sellers actually couldn't sell their house they were giving away boats with their house you buy my house I'll give you my boat you buy my house, I'll give you this Corvette I haven't driven for six months that's been in my garage. You buy my house, I'll let the wife come with it. Like all these things that they had to add on just to get their house sold. Now it's the exact opposite. Buyers are having to do the exact same thing. So what's another creative way that, that you have gotten um, contracts accepted? I, I always, always call listing agent, ask, what do you need? What does your client need? I have also pimped out my husband for his electrical business, offering his services and goods, um, like, like she had mentioned. Um, we've done like $15,000 non-refundable earnest, um, pizza party. Yeah, I mean, like, you got to get pretty creative, quite honestly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so let's talk about the non-refundable earnest money that's a good one to um to talk about when you're writing in a contract and you really want the buyer to get it what kind of terms do you put on the uh, non-refundable earnest money missy the only terms that we had on it were um it was refundable only until the appraisal. And once the appraisal value came back in at that point, it was no longer refundable. And if the buyers were to back out, the seller could have kept that um, deposit. Um, but that was the only contingency that they would have been able to get that non-refundable earnest money back was if it didn't appraise. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the earnest money actually makes a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. Not to everybody, but to a lot of people, they see $500 in there and they're like, mm, they don't have a lot of skin in the game. Mm -hmm. And they see another one that has 3000 and they just look at it different. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you're exactly right. What kind of price point was that? Um, that was about 300,000. Okay. So it was about 5% of the total price point that you put down as earnest money. And after appraisal, you made it 
non-refundable. So take that into consideration when you're writing offers. It definitely changes the, the, the motivation of the buyer to walk away so easily. Um, and you have to- Are you doing inspections? Oh, I'm sorry, Chrissy, I thought you were done. Are you doing inspections with that non-refundable earnest money too, or? Yep, yep. We've done inspections like option two pretty much. Um, and a lot of people like option two, but like Christy said in her broker video, you can actually just change your mind for any reason during that time period and walk away. You don't have, even have to have the inspection done. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if I was a seller, that would concern me. But for some reason, the no repairs coming at you is appealing. So the um, I've had a few people who have buyers or I'm sorry, sellers that have said they won't take option two anymore. They will only do one or three. You're either taking it as is or you're taking it as is with an inspection with the opportunity to negotiate repairs because they were getting fed up with people checking the option two box, then either trying to negotiate or walk away for some stupid frivolous reason. Um, I think when you have the, the one or three, it's much more of a committed because the, the option one means you're not having an inspection. You're buying that bad boy as is. Buyer beware. Whatever you get, you got. Don't complain. Um, option three is that you're buying it. You understand its current condition as you see it with your eyes. But beyond that, you want to have an inspection. And if you find something that you don't like in that inspection, you are pre-agreeing to um, negotiate in good faith those repairs. So option three requires a negotiation of repairs. We just got in the email yesterday, we just got the final draft of the new contracts in our emails yesterday, and those are supposed to be um, started training on those in April or May. And I think they're going to be trained on through the end of the year and a required use by January 1 of all LBAR members. So once I get word that it's the final final and it's approved by the board, I'll shoot it out so everybody can start reading it and, and learning it and we'll do a couple classes on it. But it does not have any options. It's inspection with a discovery period, kind of like the commercial real estate where you have so many days to just decide if you want the house or not. It doesn't have box one, two, or three. It's only inspection or no inspection. So it's going to change how our market's doing. And it also is um, time is of the essence, meaning if you pass that closing date, deal's dead as if it never existed. So you got to make sure you give yourself enough time to close the checkbox. But we'll get on all that later. This just made me think of that. Um, the... Has anybody, has anybody's buyer offered to pay your buyer's commissions to this instead of the seller? You have, Missy, how did that work? Um, it actually worked out great. It was a uh, for sale by owner and um, we put my commission into the offer price. And as long as it appraised for that, um, they were fine with it, but um, yeah, it worked out perfect. So the sellers were glad they didn't have to pay my commission and the buyers were happy because they really wanted me there. So mm -hmm. praised and life was good. good. Awesome. Jessica, did you raise your hand? Okay, go ahead. Who was that? Me. <laughs> um, the house I had listed in Lawrenceburg that is under contract. Um, those the buyers of that property, they offered um, like 10,000 less than what we had it listed at. But then they offered to pay their realtor closing costs or commission. Mm -hmm. Instead of your seller paying it. Yes. Gotcha. 
that might be something that you can do. We talked about this last year and it was like, oh, I don't know. That's weird. I don't want to talk about my commissions in the middle of this transaction. Well, guess what? They're already talking about it. When they walk out that door and they know they're buying a $400,000 house, they can, they can do multiplication too. Four times three is 12. There is no secret that we make commission in, in these transactions. So when you're, when you're talking about negotiating, if you have a client that has an excessive amount of cash, which a lot of people do right now, which is insane, um, then you want to see how can I use this to their benefit? Do they need it all to be put down? This is where having conversations with lenders is really important and understanding loan products is really, really important. Because if you're coming at a seller with a VA or an FHA and they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to get into that. But then you offer all these other extra exciting, not normal, you know, benefits to the seller, like mowing your grass or $2,500 in concessions for repairs, or we'll pay the realtors. Then all of a sudden that loan product doesn't look so scary because they're getting all this other stuff. Um, so Jennifer, is your hand raised for a reason or was that an accident? Yeah, I just wanted to say something and sorry, I thought I wasn't going to talk during this meeting, but here I go. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I always tell my clients, my buyers, because on my listings, people that were winning were going like $30,000 over asking price, but then also saying they would pay a $30,000 appraisal gap, meaning if the house didn't appraise, they would pay over that up to the, you know, that 30,000 over, right? So to make that easy, if the house was a hundred thousand, they would pay a 30,000 or the, the purchase price was 100,000, they would pay 130 and then say they would pay 30 over up to 130, right? They wouldn't pay 30 over the appraisal and then pay more. Um, and then also they were doing no inspections. They uh, just all kinds of crazy stuff. No inspections and appraisal gaps were huge for my sellers um, because they knew that way we don't have to worry about the appraisal and obviously the inspection. Now, just so you guys know, I always tell my buyers, it's up to them if they wanna do that. I'm not gonna pressure them to do something like that but let them know other people are doing that. And the reason why is I had a lot of people calling me last year saying, my agent's not winning offers for me. I want you to be my realtor. I heard you're, you're winning offers, right? And so you'll lose buyers if you don't tell them what other people are doing. So when I tell them, at least they know and they know why they're losing and they know it's not my fault. <laughs> That's true. That's, that is 100% true. Appraisal gaps right now are a lot of what is winning what is winning the offer. So if you've got a, a buyer that, like I said before, has extra cash on hand and they can afford to um, pay the overage or the difference between what a house appraises for and the actual sales price, then discuss with them their options. And it's important because sometimes we had one, we had someone win who was it that won the other day by a hundred dollars? Was that you, April? I thought someone, there was someone who texted me or the office or something and said that they won their contract negotiation by $100. So someone else had had an escalation. I, mine was, uh, we had an escalation clause and they, um, they accepted our offer because it was cash, but it was like, it was a little bit less than the other offer because of the, esca well, because it was cash. That's why they okay. accepted it. But it was, I mean, it was like within $2,000. Okay. There was someone that, that just sold something recently and literally won by a hundred bucks. So money, money is a huge factor. Terms are a huge factor. Um, the creativity is a huge factor. And um, I love the idea of calling the agent and asking them what they need. A lot of times when you do call them, they, they have what I call diarrhea of the mouth, excuse me for being gross. But a lot of agents don't know when to stop talking. They just keep telling you way too much information. And that helps a buyer sometimes because if, you know, you know that, that they're in a weird situation, then you can word your contract in a way that'll, that'll help them out of that weird or, in, you know, situation. But in the end, it is the buyer's decision. 
And what I have seen from you guys and the thousands of contracts that we're writing is that sometimes it takes them one or two to lose. Then they start getting real aggressive. They get tired of losing offers um, and then they get really aggressive. So is there any other ways that you guys are winning? No other ways? Who's written an offer in the last couple of weeks and lost? Raise your hand. Who's written an offer in the last couple of weeks and won? Okay. So it's like, a, it's become a numbers game and um, having the, the buyers, like I said in the beginning of the meeting, having the buyers is, is easy right now getting them in houses is what is is the strategic part and um the more that the more that you lose as a realtor you probably get frustrated and you want to you want to win more so to kind of recap what we talked about do non-refundable earnest monies do um you could, there's there's some people that I've seen that in, they're writing if it's an earnest money that's not fifteen thousand dollars because I would never suggest this but um, they're writing the check directly to the seller instead of in our escrow so the seller has it they don't have to worry about a release being signed to get it they've got the money the inspection clauses they put something in the contract that says we will not we will do inspections too, but we will not walk for any repair value under $3,000. So we will only walk if there's damage or repairs that need to be done that exceed 3,000, 5,000, whatever that amount is. Then you've got the escalation clauses. Um, then you have appraisal gaps. One thing I want to, I want to mention is when all this went off the rails, like two summers ago, and everybody started using these escalation clauses and everybody started um, just offering absurd amounts for houses, knowing that they weren't valued at this new dollar amount that, that they're paying. There was a lot of times that when the contract was signed based on the fact that the seller thought that instead of $220,000, they're now getting $250,000 for their house. All the other buyers went along their way and it was just the buyer and the seller standing there looking at each other with their realtors when the house appraised for, you know, 225 and not 250. And now the seller's visions of dollars that were dancing through their mind isn't as wonderful as they thought it would be. And the buyer was able to, to scare away all the other buyers because they made this fantastic offer that made the seller feel like they were going to get so much more out of this client, this buyer when it wasn't really true. Now you've got, because people caught on to that really quick, um, now you have these appraisal gaps. And these appraisal gaps are a huge key into how you win offers. Um, a, you know, offering to pay $5,000 more than appraised, $10,000 more than appraised. Cash offers, cash is king right now. If you've got a cash buyer, you're probably not gonna lose. And that's that's crazy. Um, the cash buyers out there are very much, um, you know, literally just writing checks. I do wanna mention this because if this comes across my desk and we get in trouble because you've done this after I've told you this, I'm gonna remember today and everybody who's on this call, a home equity line of credit is not cash. A refinance where you're pulling money out of a house to pay for something else is not cash. Cash is the money in the bank that you can write a check on or you can go and take out of the bank that day. That is cash. Money in an IRA, money in a retirement fund, those are not cash. So when you are writing your offers and you write cash on there, you need to look at your person and say, 
do you, can you spend this money today? Can you go and get this money right this second and spend it today? And if they say yes, then that's cash. If it's in an IRA, then you write cash on that offer, but then you write the contingency on page four that says the sell, the buyers have to remove this money from an IRA or the buyers have to remove this money from blah, 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 because you are misrepresenting the facts and we can all be in trouble. So you have to be really careful with cash too. We ran into that. Um, I think it was this week. This week has been really long. So I think it was this week that, that I ran into that where they said it was cash and it wasn't. And it wound up not closing because oh boy took money out of his retirement fund and they took too much as a penalty and he didn't have the cash. So we looked a little foolish. So just know that. Um, but do you have anything else you want to discuss? Is there anything top of mind that you feel like you want to, you know, you're struggling and you're like, hey, I need, I need some help here. You've been awful quiet today. Are we like worn out because it's sunny? Karen, are you, are you raising your hand? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I actually have a question about that cash because I'm glad you brought that up. <clears throat> Um, I have a buyer right now that we're looking for a property. Um, they are selling their home um, out of town. And so they're going to, they're wanting to pay cash after their house um, sells. It goes on the market this week. So if they find something prior to their house going on the market or prior to closing on their, on their current home, um, you know, they're going to pay cash in the future. So do I just put cash and then contingent upon um, their home selling? Mm -hmm. So your contingency would look like this. You would put cash on your financing part on page one. And then on page okay. four, you would say, this cash purchase is contingent upon the sale and closing of whatever address and then you say, if, if buyer does not sell and close on aforementioned address, they will not be able to, they will have the option to void this contract and earnest money will be refunded to buyer. When okay. you put that in there, you're disclosing where the cash is coming from if it's not in the bank. Okay. All right. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> See, that's why these are great. That's why these are great. So, so yeah, that's very important. Okay, thank you. you. No problem. Anyone else? I have a cash buyer that's um, looking at about the three hundred thousand dollar range, and we uh -huh. made an offer, and we were like, "Yeah, we got cash. Just, I mean, it really is just cash in a deposit, um, safety deposit box." And they had four other similar cash offers. Oh, yeah. So that's what you're up against, and. Now I'm the listing agent. We have multiple offers and almost every single offer has an appraisal gap value. So like it's happening like almost every contract. Yeah. And just for a side note, do you know that just because I'm sorry, my, my phone comes to my computer and then you all disappear when my phone rings, you all just leave the screen. Um, do you know that when you get, let's say you get five offers and they are all similar, do you know that you do not have to accept any one of those five offers that you can pick the one you like? Let's say one of them is cash at 250 and the other one is a loan at 275. You can go back to the cash person and say, we wanna accept your offer, but you're gonna have to pay 275 to accept it. Did you know that you could do that? You don't have to accept their offer as it comes in in a multiple offer. You can still counter back as a seller. You can counter back to the terms that you like on another offer and use their financing or vice versa. So just because you get multiple offers, it doesn't mean that you have to choose one that's presented to you. Hi, cutie pie. You can, you can go back and counter some of the other terms that you liked better in the other offers to your favorite offer. Or 
I didn't say this, but I'm saying it. We're recording. Someone turned this off, I guess. If there's a realtor within the transaction to you, I love seeing you. Nothing. Going once, going twice. All righty. Have a wonderful um, month. We will do this on, I think it's the second Friday of every month at 11 or 1130. So um, just watch for the calendar, all um, RER YouTube people, and then look out for the announcement at our, um, our Zoom meeting. I think it's next week, next Tuesday, maybe for our announcements of our monthly statistics and who did um, who did top five in our RER YouTube club. If you guys need anything, please feel free to reach out. I'm always here to help and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. See Thank ya. you. You're welcome, bye.